If you would but tear open the heavens and come down so that mountains would quake before you. And when fire kindles brushwood and fire makes water boil to make your name known to your adversaries so that nations will tremble at your presence. When you did wonders we dared not hope for, you came down and mountains quaked before you. Such things had never been heard or noted. No eye had seen them, O oh God, but you who act for those who trust in you. Yet you have struck him who would gladly do justice and remember you in your ways. It is because you are angry that we have sinned. We have been steeped in them from old. Can we be saved? We have all become like an unclean thing and all our virtues like a filthy rag. We're all withering like leaves and our iniquities like a wind carry us off. Yet no one invokes your name rouses himself to cling to you. For you have hidden your face from us and made us melt because of our iniquities. But now, O oh Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hands. Be not implacably angry, O oh Lord. Do not remember our iniquity forever. Oh, look down to your people, to us all. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord lives forever. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It is time. It's time. The sanctuary is lively with color and uh, trees and candelabras. And the first candle of expectation has been lit. Lights up our hearts with the hope that only God can give. It may seem like this time has already begun. As soon as Halloween ended, stores were putting up their Christmas displays and making their, uh, playing their cheery Christmas music. Most people waited until after Thanksgiving at least to light up their houses, but not everybody saw some houses lit up before that even passed. But really, the time is now. Now is the beginning of Advent. Now we begin looking to the Lord to help us prepare for the arrival of the promised Messiah. We people who are like clay, you know, I've sculpted clay before. Well, maybe sculpted really isn't the word. I remember in elementary school having those little projects in art class. Um, once I made a little version of the Titanic. I was kind of fascinated by uh, them finding and exploring the Titanic at the bottom of the ocean. My Titanic wasn't much of a replica other than the four smokestacks and kind of looking like a boat. Uh, it didn't have a whole lot in common with the actual Titanic. Another time I made a dinosaur. It was supposed to be a brontosaurus. To my dismay, a, a few years ago, re researchers decided that the brontosaurus never actually existed, like they mixed up the bones. and This really bummed me out because that was my favorite dinosaur which, of course, is why I tried to fashion one out of clay. Uh, thankfully, a couple years after that, a new researcher suggests that it did, in fact, exist, and um, so that, that uh, was really exciting um, for my, uh, myself, being that my awful work of my creative mind uh, wasn't in vain after all. Turned out looking more like a uh, blob with a long neck than anything. That's not actually mine. Mine was a lot worse than that. But it was my little creation. It meant something to me. It was funny to look at those little sculptures and how not good I was at molding clay. But they were exactly what I formed with my own hands, and they were special to me. This image that Isaiah uses, that we are the clay and God is the potter. It's a metaphor that we can all relate to in some way. 
Of course, an actual potter's creation is going to come with a lot more craftsmanship and beauty than many of us could pull off, uh, especially me. But we've each held handcrafted bowls and dishes and things like that that have been made by a, a real potter. And we've probably all had experiences of our own making things out of clay, some better or some worse. You know, it was an image that the people of the time knew very well, though. like very, very well. It, it's uh, where all their dishes and pots and water jugs came from, not to mention statues and things like that that were all over the area. Uh, potter was a common specialized occupation, like working with wood or iron or whatever. And it sent a very powerful message about God and about who they were. This passage, uh, it comes from a time when the Israelites were released from exile to move back home. After the uh, Babylonians wiped out the southern kingdom and removed them from the land, about a generation or so uh, later, the Persians defeated the Babylonians and allowed the Israelites to go home and rebuild. While that was wonderful, it came with a lot of complications. Their own balance of power was thrown out of whack. Who had what positions became an issue. All the while knowing that the real political power lied with the Persians. Those who did come home had some issues with folks who were still there and were never sent into exile. Uh, who would get what positions. Whether or not people returning would get the positions they had before whether or not David's family would continue being the, the family line that represented them, his royalty. Who would be involved with the priesthood? Some were home, and some others decided not to even come home. It was a very, very different situation than it was before. All this while the whole temple rebuilding project and how to reestablish their own community hung over their heads. It continued to be a very tough time for the Israelites. And that's the situation in which Isaiah was speaking. Oh God, if you would just come down and tear open the heavens so that the mountains would quake before you to make your name known to your adversaries. We've suffered for our sins and we continue to suffer. We continue to struggle. We know that you are lo Lord over all. We know that we are not in control as we like to think we are. You've done wonderful things for us in the past. Please come do wonderful things again. Lord, help us turn back to you fully. Help us really straighten out. We are the clay. You are the potter. Lord, please look down upon us with your favor. Words spoken to acknowledge God's power over all things, pleading the Lord to intervene and reshape them to be who they were made to be in the first place, believing and trusting that God would respond and do just that. We are the clay. You are the potter. Those little creations that I made as a kid, uh, those little clay things, they couldn't mold themselves. They didn't, they didn't have that kind of ability, they didn't have that kind of power, they didn't have that kind of creative, creativity. As awful as my little creations were, it came from a substance that was quite easy to work with. It was totally up to me whatever I wanted to make out of it. The substance God has to work with isn't so easy. We as the clay, we do have some ability, some power, some creativity. We have free will, so we can try to mold ourselves as much as we want. For God to work with us, we have to choose to be the clay. And all too often, we're not so willing to conform to what God wants to do with us. We can be a real pain to work with. I'm glad I don't have to be a potter of this kind of clay. But if we do choose to humble ourselves and invite God into our lives more and more to shape and reshape us, then we become something much better, so much more beautiful than we could ever be on our own. As Paul says to the Corinthians, 
In the Lord, we are enriched in every way, in speech and knowledge, in strength and faithfulness, in our ability to do the right thing, to offer care and concern, compassion and mercy to others. To be God's clay is to be willing to be enriched in every way. To be God's clay is to admit that we're not really in control and to be willing to ask for God's guidance. To be God's clay is to recognize that we can't just do it on our own, but to be willing to look to the Lord for help. To be God's clay is to remember that we were made in God's image and to be willing to be reshaped into God's image once again. To be God's clay is to be willing. And that is precisely what brings us back around to this first Sunday of Advent. Now there's a lot of terrible things going along in the world these days. We've got a lot of tough things that we're dealing with in our daily lives. Much like post-exile Israel. As people of the world today, as a nation, as a local community, as individuals, it really comes down to this. It all comes down to this. In just a few weeks, a baby will be born. God will enter into the world in a brand new way. It's been a long time coming, a lot of hopeful expectation for a Messiah to come and make things right and to make us right. With this baby being born comes hope because this baby will grow up to teach us, to heal us, to lead us, to give up his own life for us, to give us eternal life. This baby will show us what it means to be God's clay. By embracing this baby with open hearts, we'll learn what it means to be willing. And we'll be filled with hope for the future that only God can provide. Now is the time. Let us be God's clay. May we become the beauty that God creates. Amen.